spiritual cancer that is eating away at a lot of Christian lives. And I want to I want to talk to you about that. But I want to set it up this way. Please, please don't think that I'm trying to beat up on you. <laughs> I'm trying to help you, okay? Because I'm going to talk about something that I think is a very common problem in Christian lives, but I'm not going to leave you in the problems. I'm going to try to show you how to have victory over it, okay? So that's my purpose tonight. And I want to begin by saying this. I think that if you were asked to sum up the Bible in one word, you could probably do so with the word forgiveness. Because the Bible is a story about how God has made a way to forgive all of humanity. Not that all of humanity will accept God's forgiveness, but the Bible is the story of God offering forgiveness to humanity. But here's my question as we think about that. How can we, as believers, tell others about God's forgiveness if we are harboring unforgiveness in our own heart? In fact, I think that that really comes to light in the model prayer that Jesus gives the pattern for in what we call the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer. Listen to what he says in that prayer. You remember, he says, and when you pray, pray, and forgive us our debts as we forgive what? Our debtors. And then a couple of verses down, he says, If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And he's not talking about salvation, but he's talking about fellowship. That if you have an unforgiving heart, you're out of fellowship with God. Just simple as that. Unforgiveness gets rooted into a person's heart, and it becomes bitterness. And that bitterness is like cancer. And so after we pray, I want to speak a little bit about the cancer of bitterness. Perhaps you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 12 uh, to get a reference uh, in that chapter, and we'll look at it after we pause a moment and pray. Father, you know your children, and you know what we have to struggle with at times. And Lord, I pray that you would point out in my heart or any hearts here or any that would be listening in now or in the future on the Internet, any cancer of bitterness, an unforgiving spirit, a root of bitterness, as it's called in Scripture, in the heart of any listener. Oh, God, we need, we need to be set free. Lord, we need your cure for this terrible spiritual cancer. And so I pray that you might use this time together tonight. I want to give these people hope. I want to show them that there's hope, that this can be cured. You've given it a cure. So, Lord, we just pray that you'll use this tonight in all of our lives. We want Jesus to be exalted. We want him to be glorified, honored by the change that we allow him to bring in our lives. And we pray this then in his name, for his sake. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 12, I've asked you to turn the writer of Hebrews tells us in verse 15 that we are to look very diligently. We are to look very diligently for what? Lest any man fail of the grace of God. 
lest any of us fail to keep pace with what the grace of God wants to do in our lives. Because if we don't let God's grace be active in our lives, it's probably very likely that it will then result in bitterness. Look at verse 15 again. He says, lest any root of bitterness... Bitterness is a root sin. It is a root sin. In other words, a lot of sin grows out of bitterness. Lest a root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and that would be bad enough, but notice, and thereby many be defiled. So an unforgiving spirit that develops a root of bitterness not only will impact you negatively, but will impact others around you as well. It's a danger that we let a root of bitterness, as it's called here, grow up in our hearts. It's a picture of a plant. A plant, a plant always grows from a root. And if a plant's root is bad, if a plant's root is sick, if a plant's root has a a blight, it is going to affect the whole plant and all the fruit that that plant might produce, whether it be a flower or actual fruit, all of that will be affected by a bad root. It's no good. Nothing would be good. If you were or will be diagnosed with cancer, how would you get rid of that cancer? Would you be satisfied if, say, a surgeon performed surgery on a cancerous tumor in your body, and when you came uh, out uh, from under the anesthesia, you were told by the surgeon, well, we got most of it. Would that be satisfactory in your mind? You see, if you don't get rid of all of the cancer, it's going to progressively grow back and it will spread through your whole body. That is a picture of what a root of bitterness is in a Christian life. It is terminal. Just as a a cancerous tumor becomes terminal, a root of bitterness and resentment in a heart is like a deadly cancer that grows and it spreads and it, and it uh, eventually affects not only that person, but defiles many others in the process. It's terminal. It's deadly. But not only is it terminal, it's transmissible. You know what you know what a transmissible disease is? <laughs> it means it's uh, it's uh, it's infectious. It's uh, it's contagious. And that's why he says in that 15th verse, many are defiled by it. Not just the person that has the bitterness and the resentment in their heart, but all that come in contact with them are impacted by it. It's transmissible. If you harbor a wrong feeling in your heart toward one or many others, it is never a secret thing. It's infectious. It's contagious. It's like a toxic poison or cancer that spreads through an entire body. And you know, the Bible calls believers the body of Christ, And so one root of bitterness in one believer's heart can infect the whole body of Christ, an entire local church. The cancer of bitterness. Let's talk about the cause of it. What causes bitterness? Well, I think that the main cause of bitterness is 
some hurt or some suffering that uh, we have encountered sometime in our life. In fact, truth of the matter is, is absolutely impossible to do life without getting hurt along the way, without facing some type of suffering. That's just what life is. It's, it's a very imperfect and often a, a, a horrible experience in some cases. And so that's the cause of bitterness. Many, I think, have set themselves up for hurtful experiences by poor and wrong choices that they make in life. But occasionally, people are mistreated undeservedly, unjustly. For spirit-filled Christians, being hurt and suffering is inevitable. It's absolutely inevitable. Because when you partner with Jesus, it's God's will that if you live godly, you will suffer persecution. That's the will of God. That's what the Bible teaches. I want to jump back uh, for uh, a few minutes to 1 Peter chapter 4. You don't have to turn, but listen to these verses. This is 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, by the way. That's what God calls his people, dearly loved ones. Beloved, don't think it strange. Don't think it foreign concerning the fiery trial, which is to test you as though some foreign thing happened unto you. He's talking about believers suffering for Christ. It's inevitable. It's actually what Christ calls us to. We're called as believers to the inevitable, the expected suffering as a godly person. And there's no option. There's no opting out of it. It's just, it's life as a believer. And we need to know the reality of this situation so we're not taken by surprise. But it's inevitable. But often, because we don't understand some things, and we don't know how to deal with these things when they happen, it becomes the cause of bitterness when we're hurt or we suffer. Not only is it inevitable, but it is enviable. You say, what? Why would, uh, why would I uh, uh, envy someone that's being hurt or suffering? Well, if you are suffering for Jesus' sake, if you're suffering for the Lord, the Bible says if you are mistreated for, for Jesus, for Christ, you're highly prized. You're in a highly prized position that God's put you in. You're in a place where you please God. You know, you remember Philippians 1.29, Sunday morning? Not only is it our privilege to believe in the Lord, but to suffer for his sake. It's a privilege the Bible says it's a, so if you are mistreated for Christ's sake, you are in an enviable position, a highly prized, you, you please God, listen to this in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. This is a thankworthy, this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Goes on to say in the 20th verse, for what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it and take it patiently, this is acceptable or pleasing to God. It's an enviable position to suffer for the Lord. It's God puts you in a highly prized position. It pleases him. It, it's actually uh, a, a privilege and uh, it's something that would give you reason to rejoice. Remember Peter and John? When they cast, uh, or rather when they heal that lame man at the temple, and they are cast into prison for it. In, in Acts chapter 5, uh, they, are, they are beaten by the Jewish authorities for it. 
And it says that they walked out of it rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus' sake. They rejoiced that they were beat for Jesus because he counted them worthy to suffer like that. It's a badge of honor. It's actually a blessing. In 1 uh, Peter chapter 4 and verses 13 and 14, listen to this. Rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he's evil spoken of, but on your part, he's glorified. It's a badge of honor. It's a blessing to suffer for the Lord, to be hurt for the Lord, to be mistreated for Christ's sake. Now, the rest of the minutes that we have left, I want to talk about the cure for bitterness. And this is the part, maybe if you have a pen and pencil, you want to write this down. This is actually from the book, this part. And I was thinking, you know, there are various treatments uh, for cancer, and some are more promising than others, but they haven't come up with a cure for cancer yet, have they? There's no cure. But there is a cure for the cancer of bitterness. God has a cure for it. And this is where the hope comes in. There is a cure for a bitter, resentful, unforgiving heart. And there are three things that uh, I wanted to share with you tonight uh, that I think will be helpful. And the first one is this. If you want God's cure for bitterness, you must, first of all, identify and release. Let, let me explain what uh, we mean by that. First of all, identify those who hurt you. Uh, make a list if you have to. Identify those who hurt you and don't retaliate against them. Stop retaliating against them. Paul said it this way, and he's quoting actually, I think, from the book of Proverbs. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Stop retaliating. Identify those who hurt you, but don't retaliate against them. Instead, Release them to God to deal with them. Did you know that he can deal with them better than we can? He can handle them. Listen, again, I'm going back to uh, 1 Peter. Listen to this. 1 Peter 2.23 is talking about Jesus, who when he was reviled, he didn't revile again back. When he suffered, he didn't threaten back. You know what he did? He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who is that? His heavenly father. He committed himself and what was happening to him to his heavenly father, trusting that his heavenly father will handle it, will deal with it. Very similar, and we are told in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, verse 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls or their life to him, that is to the Father, in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. What, do you, what does that mean? That, that means that you identify those people that have hurt you and you release them to God to deal with them because if you don't, you're going to become bitter. And when we become bitter... We, whether we realize it or not, are seeking to make God accountable to us and we're questioning his sovereignty. Lord, you're not able to take care of this. You can't deal with them. I got to deal with it. It's a total wrong attitude. So the first step in a cure for, for bitterness is that you identify and release. And the second uh, step that I, I wanted to share with you tonight is... Uh, you forgive from the heart. Turn over to Matthew 18 with me, please. Matthew 18 is where Peter comes to Jesus, and he says, Lord, 
<clears throat> if uh, if a, a person sins against me, how often do I have to forgive my brother that sins against me? Seven times? He thought that that was probably really uh, nice on his part. I'll forgive him seven times. And seven is the number of completion, perfection, right? And Jesus comes back and says in the next verse, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. So what does he mean? On the 491st time, you don't forgive him? No. What Jesus is saying is that you and I must be willing to and commit ourselves to unlimited forgiveness. You say, but what if they don't mean it? That's not the point. Unlimited forgiveness. Now, you can't do this. I can't do this. We have to depend upon God for that grace that we sang about. We have to depend upon God for the ability, the enablement to forgive. And then we have to let him deal with them because we, we trust him to take care of the results. And then Jesus illustrated this unlimited forgiveness in the parable that follows that. Uh, if you would pick it up and, and read verses 23 to 34, which we don't have time to do, but it basically is there's this servant and um, uh, he owes his master, I mean, millions of dollars. And he goes before his master and he falls down and he begs him, please, you know, have mercy upon me. And his master completely forgives millions of dollars of debt. The same guy then goes out and he finds a fellow servant that owes him 10 bucks. <laughs> and he grabs him by the neck and, and says, pay up now, or I'm going to have you arrested and thrown into prison for and the guy does the same thing that he did, and he falls down before his fellow servant and begs for mercy, and he ignores him and has him arrested and, and put into prison. And then Jesus, here he, he applies the, the uh, parable in verse 35. He says, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. That is, if you hold on to, if you harbor resentment and unforgiveness, you are going to give the enemy ground in your life to keep on tormenting you. That's the point Jesus is making. So, identify and release, forgive from the heart, and third and finally, live with the consequences you have to be willing to live with ongoing consequences of the person's actions that offended you. And that is going to require that you maintain an ongoing vital fellowship with Holy Spirit. Last passage I'll have you turn to tonight is Ephesians chapter 4. Now, Ephesians chapter 4 is really key in what we're talking about here tonight, the cure for bitterness, because we get early on in this, uh, in this discussion, in the 26th verse, he says, be angry and sin not, Do, uh, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. And you get, a, you get information there that is vitally important that we have to always remember, and that's this. Before anyone is bitter, before anyone is resentful, they get angry. Anger, he says in that 27th verse, if you harbor anger, you give place, you give space, you give a foothold to the devil. Sometimes we wonder, where did that come from? All of a sudden, people just melt down. Well, they have this anger that they have not dealt with. They've just let it seethe in them, and they've given a wide open field for the devil to set up bivouac in and carry out his mission 
and his oppression in our lives. Anger opens the door to bitterness because it opens the door to the devil is what he say. And what's the, what's the key to that? Well, how do you deal with that? Well, drop down in this passage to verse 30. He says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. To not grieve the Holy Spirit of God means that you have a real, vital fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But I say, and I, I, I don't mean this uh, to cheapen the person of the Holy Spirit, most believers don't even know who the Holy Spirit is. They treat him, as the saying says, like a red-headed stepchild. They don't want anything to do with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we independent Baptists are the worst because we react from maybe some of the, uh, the excesses that we've seen take place in the name of the Holy Spirit. And so we completely write them off. If you don't have a vital fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you can't deal with bitterness. And you grieve the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say, if you look with me, in the next verse, 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, see how they all fit together, and clamor, uh, clamor, loud yelling, and evil speaking, that's slander, and uh, be put away from you with all malice, that's just uh just having a bad attitude toward people. And be ye kind, verse 32, one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Replace that sinful bitterness and all of those things that uh, are named here that go along with it. Replace all of that with verse 32, forgiveness. Forgive the way Jesus has forgiven you. You know how he's forgiven you and me? Totally. You know how he's forgiven you and me? Eternally. As you have been forgiven by Jesus, so you now have the ability with the, with a, the Holy Spirit's enablement to forgive the way Jesus forgave you. Remember, Forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. Forgiveness is an act of obedience in which you depend upon God to enable you to forgive that person even when you don't feel like it. God's not asking you to feel something. He's asking you to do something. Forgive as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And you can and you must depend upon God to enable you to forgive even when you're feeling like saying no, you can forgive. By the way, this book that I, that I mentioned, it has a, a section in that uh, that gives even more detailed steps on forgiveness and getting rid of bitterness. And so if you'd be interested in that, I, I can uh, look that up for you and share it with you. But I wanted to... I, I don't know if I have time. I have a, a lengthy illustration that I thought uh, would really drive home what I'm trying to say. Shortly after the turn of the, uh, the, the 20th century, Japan invaded uh, and conquered and occupied the country of Korea. And Japan was just ruthless. Um, many Koreans uh, lived with physical and emotional scars from this Japanese occupation. And one group uh, was singled out for concentrated oppression by the Japanese, and those were the Korean Christians. By the way, sidebar, the reason God, uh, the, the reason that uh, there is so much hatred on the left and, uh, and by others for uh, the Jews and for Christians is because those are two groups that God has chosen. And they hate everything that God's for because they hate God. So that's what's going on. And that's what's happening here in this uh, thing that I'm, I'm sharing with you. So anyway, uh, 
Um, they refused to let these Korean Christians go to church. They locked the churches. They jailed many of the Christian leaders, just like they do in communist countries. And uh, this went on for a while. Uh, but there was a particular Korean pastor that he pushed the issue. And finally, he got the, the Japanese uh, commander to unlock the church and let them have a worship service. So a whole bunch of Koreans heard the word got out and they gathered in this church and they, they were going to have a Sunday worship service. And uh, as they were singing uh, nearer my God to the people were hearing this all over. And then they heard the back doors of the church being barricaded. And then the kerosene was poured on those back doors and uh, fumes were filling the sanctuary as the church was burning. And these people, they kept singing. They kept singing. And uh, as they sang songs, the pastor led them in, in uh, songs that we know. Nearer my God to thee, um, at the cross, at the cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, did my sovereign die. The music uh, uh, and the wails of children were finally over lost by the roar of the flames. The Korean people couldn't forgive the Japanese for that. It wasn't until 1972, a group of Japanese pastors were traveling through Korea and they came upon the memorial of that horrible spot. They read the details of that tragedy and the names of their brothers and sisters uh, that uh, perished in that, uh, in that terrible incident. And so they were so overcome with shame that they went back to Japan and they said, we have to do something to break down this wall. And they gathered money together and they went back and they built a church on that same spot. And uh, when the dedication service for the new building was held, there was a special delegation of Japanese believers that uh, joined with relatives and special guests uh, of the Koreans there. And uh, speeches were made, details of the tragedy were recalled, the names of the dead, of course, were honored, and it was time to bring the service to a close, but someone in charge thought it would be appropriate to conclude with the same two songs that were sung as the church burned. And when they started to sing, Nearer My God to Thee, something remarkable happened. As the memories of those uh, of the past mixed with the truth of the song, resistance began to melt away. And that inspiration gave hope to that collective group of churchgoers. And at the, uh, as the song leader closed the service with the hymn at the cross, these typically stoic Japanese could, couldn't contain themselves. They began to weep. And as they wept, tears gushed from deep inside, they turned to their Korean spiritual brothers and sisters and they begged them to forgive them, even though they didn't do it. And the guarded and the calloused hearts of the Koreans were, weren't quick to surrender, but the love of these Japanese brothers and sisters, unintimidated by all of these decades of hatred, finally broke down the hardness of the Koreans emotions at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away one Korean turned toward a Japanese brother and then another and then the floodgates holding back a wave of emotion let go and the Koreans met their new Japanese friends in the middle and they clung to each other and they wept Japanese tears of repentance and Korean tears of forgiveness intermingled to bathe the sight of an old nightmare Heaven had sent the gift of reconciliation to a little church in Korea.
That's that's how you get rid of bitterness. That's a wonderful illustration of what the Holy Spirit of God can do in the worst, bitterest, resentful, hateful hearts.